PM says Maseratis will still be used by foreign officials. Growth, connectivity and reform discussed at APEC officials meeting. And 500 US troops arrive in Port Moresby. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Wednesday's news. The APEC concluding senior officials meeting ended on Tuesday. According to the country's APEC Ambassador 7 CSOM Chair Ivan Pomelu, the hard work has been done and the country is now in the final stages of focusing on the digital economy to address Papua New Guinea's development challenges. For the year. The concluding senior officers meeting which ended yesterday focused on ongoing challenges faced by PNG and the other APEC economies. CSOM Chair Ivan Pomalu says as hosts, PNG has opted to focus on growth, inclusivity, connectivity and structural reform and to ensure that conservations on the digital economy becomes more evident during the remaining APEC meetings. These include discussions focusing on small and medium-term enterprises and gender issues. Over the course of the next day, in fact tomorrow, the ministers will be uh, meeting and we, we certainly expect that they will, they will be uh, looking at the global economic environment and discuss the opportunities that are there and the emerging challenges. Uh, and we certainly uh, expect that they will be uh, looking at how APEC will exert its leadership in terms of dealing with some of those challenges. We, we also expect that the ministers will talk about connectivity issues, how to promote domestic connectivity and also to encourage inclusive growth uh, in areas of food security, uh, in areas of natural resources and, and we certainly hope uh, in areas of women economic empowerment. The meeting also focused on the use of technology and digital inclusion to see sustainable growth and development. APEC Secretariat Executive Director Dr. Alan Bollard says PNG is working on achieving sustainable growth through digital inclusion, which is this year's APEC theme. A key part of this is to enable remote areas to have access to the new technologies. But I think the other thing that Papua New Guinea is doing, which is really more unique to this year, is working a particular approach for sustainable and inclusive growth by testing how we can be using digital technologies, electronic commerce, the internet economy to work not just for big supply chains, not just for big multinational companies, but for small, medium enterprises and micro enterprises as well. In the CSOM meeting that ended yesterday, the importance of standing in solidarity and being strategic about how to respond to these challenges was noted. Rayon Lakingu, National MTV News. The Maserati issue continues with social media erupting with questions when armored vehicles for the Philippine president arrived in Port Moresby, with some issues asking of the, if there was a need in the first place to purchase the luxury sports cars. The issue questioned to the Prime Minister during his final walkthrough of key APEC venues, with the Prime Minister Peter O'Neill commenting this afternoon justifying the purchase of the 40 Maseratis, saying the luxury sports cars will also be used for other foreign officials. Two days away from the APEC 21 leaders touching down in Port Moresby, the Prime Minister Peter O'Neill today had a final walkthrough of key APEC venues. The Hilton Hotel where the Welcome Gala dinner will be held. Well done, well done. The International Media Center where 2,000 international media will be based during the summit and the APEC House where the Leaders Summit will be held. But the number one question asked today to the Prime Minister was the 40 Maseratis and their use as the world leaders like US, Russia, China and the Philippines will be using their own armored vehicles. The Prime Minister's response is that the vehicles will be used for other foreign officials also and not only the world leaders. 40 uh, Maseratis, you know, I know people want to focus on that, but uh, it is not only the world leaders who are here. They are foreign ministers, very senior ministers of governments, uh, trade ministers, other distinguished leaders who are also going to be here using every available vehicle that we can get. And I think we have done very well so far. 
and Papua New Guineans should be very proud of it. Social media hasn't kept quiet about their views and it looks like the debate on the purchasing of the luxury sports vehicles will be debated long after the APEC Leaders Summit concludes. Adelaide Sirox Kari National, MTV News. An estimated 15,000 people are expected to visit Port Moresby during the APEC Economic Leaders Week, which kicked off yesterday. This morning, hundreds of APEC, yesterday morning rather, hundreds of APEC delegates, including international media personnel, flew into the country ahead of the APEC Summit, which begins on Saturday, November 17th. APEC support, who set up registration booths at the arrival lounge at the Jackson's International Terminal, escorted the visitors to shuttle buses after they picked up their SIM cards and access to accommodation sites. So far, the team from Indonesia, Russia and China are already in the country. The Japanese delegates were expected to arrive in Port Moresby today. Over 500 United States Marine Corps and U.S. Navy are in Papua New Guinea to support the APEC security operations as PNG counts down to the CEO's conference and APEC summit this Friday. The security personnel arrived yesterday on board the United States Naval ship Green Bay. The United States Naval ship Green Bay is a San Antonio class amphibious transport dock. This means it can carry military vehicles, boats and helicopters on its missions, both in the United States or on international waters. For this mission in Papua New Guinea, its crew members include the U.S. Marines, the U.S. Navy and Marine Light Attack Helicopter Squadron. SS Green Bay with the 500 U.S. sailors and Marines is here in Port Moresby to provide security and support for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Leader Summit. This is the second time a U.S. warship has visited Port Moresby in two months, so this is not a flash in the pan. We have brought Green Bay here as a very visible token of our dedication to a free and open Indo-Pacific region and to show our support for a successful APEC conference. The hosting of the 2018 APEC Leaders Summit has seen a show of military strength amongst countries like the United States, Australia and China. It may be through the number of security personnel arriving in PNG or the kind of fleets engaged for APEC security. The Marines of Vengeance are proud to be here with our helicopters to work as a Navy and Marine Corps team in support of the APEC Summit here in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea. For the U.S. Navy, their mission is to work with the team on board the Australian naval vessel HMAS Adelaide. Green Bay provides a much bigger response capability, which includes boats and helicopters. U.S. Navy has invested deeply in supporting the amphibious mission, as can be seen in the innovative design of this amphibious transport dock ship. Green Bay, the fourth ship of its class, is well equipped to support a variety of missions, from humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to full amphibious combat operations. The ship, the ship is named after the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Though they are working under the Joint Security Task Force Command, their primary responsibility is to ensure that the safety of U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, who will be attending the latest summit, is guaranteed. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. The arrival of the United States naval ship Green Bay, which is based out of Japan, comes with necessity military services. This includes a mini hospital and additional capabilities to support the APEC security. MTV News cadet reporter Elizabeth Guka has more. The name of the ship has ties to the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin, in the United States, with the crew having ties to Green Bay's professional football team, the Green Bay Packers. The naval ship, upon providing marine security capability, will be used to deploy marines, transport supplies and equipment, and to fly UH-1Y Huey helicopters as part of its security operations during the APEC Leaders and CEO Summit. The USS Green Bay is the second U.S. ship to visit PNG since the USS Michael Murphy DDG-12 visited Port Mosby earlier last month. 
USS Navy Commander for the Amphibious Force of the 7th Fleet, Rear Admiral Brad Cooper, ensures that the ship will show its support to provide security during APAC. Is USS Green Bay, with the 500 U.S. sailors and Marines, is here in Port Moresby to provide security and support for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Leader Summit. This is the second time a U.S. warship has visited Port Moresby in two months, so this is not a flash in the pan. We have brought Green Bay here as a very visible token of our dedication to a free and open Indo-Pacific region and to show our support for a successful APEC conference. This vessel was commissioned by the U.S. Navy in 2009 and is based in its home port of Sasebo in Japan as part of Commander Amphibious 4 7th Fleet. USS Green Bay Commanding Officer Captain Tom Schultz expresses his gratitude whilst highlighting the capabilities of the ship. The crew feels very fortunate to have the opportunity to support the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Leader Summit here in Papua New Guinea. U.S. Navy has invested deeply in supporting the amphibious mission, as can be seen in the innovative design of this amphibious transport dock ship. Green Bay, the fourth ship of its class, is well equipped to support a variety of missions, from humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to full amphibious combat operations. USS Green Bay will be collaborating with the other international and national military and Navy security forces already in Port Moresby to assist in providing security during APAC. Elizabeth Guka, National MTV News. With 2018 coming to its end, the government is still focused on delivering on the 2018 budget. One issue that needs addressing is the functional grants to the provinces, with some provinces yet to receive full payments. Treasurer Charles Abel said it was a priority of the government to address this immediately. With the announcement of the 16 billion Kina 2019 budget, Treasurer and Deputy Prime Minister Charles Abel says the government is committed to fulfilling the 2018 budget and have some money left over to begin 2019. One, deliver comprehensive budgets, but then spend the time and the effort making sure that we deliver those budgets as much as possible. Uh, we've found a trend over the last few years of supplementary budgets. Um, and a lot of the parameters uh, not being met, and a lot of the commitments in the budgets not being met. And some of those commitments, we talk about development budget all the time, but it's so important we meet our commitments in the recurrent budget. He says they have to make sure that every expenditure is catered for this year before they move on to implementing the 2019 budget. So we remain committed to the 2018 budget, and we cannot deliver a 2019 budget unless there is a success story on the 2018 budget. And our plan is to get the expenditure targets met. Our plan is to even have some money left in the bank account for the first time in a long time so we begin 2019 on a good footing. One of the issues the government has been slow to address in the 2018 budget is the functional grants. The issue was brought up in Parliament by ECP Governor Alan Bird that some provinces were still yet to receive even half of the grants. The Deputy Prime Minister says that is part of their immediate priority. And uh, one of the critical points I want to point out is things like the functional grants to provincial governments. It is so important to have an effective public service machinery. We're going to talk about the issues with the payroll, which is, which is an issue and continues to be an issue, but they need their functional grants. He stressed that he was getting on to the secretaries of Treasury and Finance to make sure they fast track the process of getting the funds out to respective provinces. I'm always pestering uh, Dari and Secretary Nangin, show me the numbers. We're doing all the hard work on the revenue side. We're doing all the hard work on the financing side. I want to make sure that you guys are also delivering on the expenditure side. Don't sacrifice things like functional grants. They are critical. We can't have public servants getting paid every fortnight and not having the money to get out there and extend those services to the people. Fidelis Sukina National, MTV News. 
A memorandum of understanding was signed between the Community Development Youth and Religion Ministry and seven districts for construction of district community development centers. The community centers will be a safe haven to address vulnerable women, girls and children who face welfare issues. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill says welfare services have been a struggle, but the government has created policies to help individuals and families. It was a historic occasion for the Community Development Youth and Religion Ministry who will now join hands with districts to build a district community development center. An office structure will be built in the seven districts, Pangya, Biala, Gazelle, Karukuhiri, Abao, Yanguru and Imbongu. Minister responsible Soro Iyo says this is a big step in addressing the pressing issues of abuse, child rights and violence. Community development is a centralized function factored in provincial administrative structure as a division providing program oversight focus on welfare, youth, women, elderly, persons with disabilities and sports. Family protection services is a key government service lacking in most communities. Many cases remain unreported with most leaving the victims suffer injuries and abuse. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill says government through the department is making policies to suit needs at district levels. The sustainability of these uh, new programs is very important because it's good enough building all this infrastructure in the districts, but if you cannot ensure that they are operating and they are sustained, then it's certainly uh, going to be a waste of uh, the limited resources that we have. For Imbongu in Southern Highlands, Open MP Pila Niningi has signed the agreement. Niningi says land has been allocated and the district is putting half a million to support the project. The community development is important. It touches the lives of people. Uh, the family uh, makes family solid, then we can build a district, we can build an entire country. Construction is expected to begin early next year. Jack LaPower Jr. National MTV News. You're with National MTV News. Stay tuned for more stories coming up after these messages. Welcome back. Veteran Papua New Guinean journalist John Egan says teachers are the frontline influences of knowledge and intelligence. Mr. Egan's gave an inspiring guest of honor speech at Holy Trinity Teachers College during its inaugural first bachelor's program and the 26th diploma in primary education graduation in Mount Hagen yesterday. Egan's urged teachers throughout Papua New Guinea to have discipline and make sure they are in the classroom from 8 a.m. to 4.06 p.m. every day. Mr. Egan says education should be a prerequisite of life or a must for children to enroll before making life choices. Mr. Egan's urged the provincial and national government when building more schools, they must invest in teacher education to complement their policies. We are at the front line of imparting knowledge, imparting intelligence. I have done that in my journalist career. I have tried to influence people. The Education Department has reintroduced the Standard Based Curriculum, or SBC, in schools this year to emphasize on standards. Teacher Education Division Assistant Secretary Alan Jim says starting next year, the elementary concept will be phased out and early childhood will be introduced. There will be upskilling training for teachers to be specialized in literacy and numeracy to reduce the high number of low literacy and numeracy rates in the country. We have inclusive education resources around the country. We need more teachers to be training in the inclusive education. Meanwhile, Holy Trinity Teachers College is the first in PNG to offer degree courses for bachelor students to teach in primary schools. They graduated their first batch of 20 degree students. Another 260 students graduated with diploma in primary teaching. Members of the 
society. Board Chairman Hugo Cope announced to the school that starting next year, Holy Trinity Teachers College will recruit postgraduate lecturers. The college is also partnering with Divinewood University to offer university courses in the college. We will also continue to promote zero tolerance on alcohol and drug consumption by students. School principal Michael Miamel says the college is confident to offer quality teacher training to fulfill PNG's Vision 2050 to educate all the children of PNG. Vasanata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. The Assembly of God Church celebrated its 70th anniversary in Western Highlands Province recently. It is one of the many churches in the Christian faith in Papua New Guinea which believes in the Pentecostal movement. The recent celebration in Mount Hagen brought together faithfuls in Jiwaka and Western Highlands provinces to celebrate. More than 2,000 faithfuls from the Assembly of God, a Christian church in PNG, gathered at the Pope's Oval in Mount Hagen and joyfully celebrated the 70th anniversary. The festive event started with creative dances and inspirational singing by youths. and then a march into the city. So today I'm a special day, Blamipla, which I'm mm celebrating -hmm. this Blah. 70 years, Blamipla, where God is coming, Piney Mipla, and I'm kissing back Mipla, and I'm passing this like around, and I'm Mipla almost like God, Mipla talk thank you long all, all Piney's Blamipla, late Kundi. Papua New Guinea is one of the countries in the world which claims to be a Christian-dominated nation with more than 50 different Christian faiths or churches. Despite the neighboring Indonesian country which is dominant with the Islam religion, PNG has a few 5,000 followers of Sini Islam, which is about less than 1% of the total population. The Christian churches also plays a big role in the development of PNG by investing in the education and health sectors of the country. Like other mainline Christian churches in PNG, the Assembly of God Church have about 30,000 church members nationwide. Long hard to go make him strong and lose him. Talk bless all of him. When him can have only go through, long harm goodness come this far. Today, me bless celebrate him. Big blood day, me bless. The AOG Church alone in Jiwaka and Western Highlands Province has four primary and secondary schools with more than 20 elementary schools as well as having more than five health centers. Fascinat Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Former Prime Minister and Mosby West Northwest MP Sir Makera Marauta is questioning a payment by oil giant Oil Search to the national government. In a statement, Sir Makera questioned the 150 million kina payment for aggrieved landowners in Gobe, Moran and Kutubu. Meanwhile, a faction of landowners in Moran PDL5 have, thre have threatened the government to shut down operations if the outstanding 35 million kina benefit is not paid. In a statement, the former Prime Minister specifically questioned why oil search has stepped in to save the government. The 150 million was processed after previous threats by landowners to shut the project. Moran landowners have a share of 35 million according to signed agreements. This week, a function from the PDL5 area demanded the government not to delay the payment. This is the money below me, but company you can a seven days notice has been issued to the government and relevant authorities by the landowners. They say it has taken almost 10 years to receive their payment. The PDL5 leaders of Moran say government has breached the UBSA signed in Kokopo. However, the state unilaterally breached the contract agreement we have entered in Kokopo, as well as the one signed in its respective license areas. 35 ILGs cover the PDL5 area. The resource owners say they remain committed to the government and developer, however, have been treated unfairly. 
Since 2014 May, shipment of oil and gas has been exported overseas to markets in Japan and Europe. You know, seven days maybe like him, so so when I'm, I'm from uh, November 14, I'm close Moran project and start done. The government and agent responsible are yet to make a formal statement, including treasury and finance. Jack Lapawe Jr. National M T V News. A six-year-old girl and a 16-year-old boy from Juwaka province are determined to go for cardiac surgery in the United States. With help from Lila Foundation, Lydia Kelly and Patrick Wingal are hopeful of accessing life-saving treatment in the near future. Lila Foundation partnered with Pacific International Hospital to provide assessment of selected patients who needed cardiac medical attention. Both Lydia and Patrick, who were born with holes in their heart, they are among six patients who are currently undergoing treatment at the Pacific International Hospital. Both come from Jiwaka. Lydia's father, Kelly Tumbewapi, says Lydia's heart defects were found in 2015. Sick blame, no at Now, doctor so I was sick at all uh, in a facility long LB member, all LB member, yeah. So I was all looking for some no cut. Um, but I'm long ago one time, all long USA. As for Patrick, his father Rocky Wilgal says he was admitted at the Port Mosby General Hospital where he got his first treatment. He still remains with the heart defect as it requires complex treatment which is expensive. These two patients are determined to go to United States for further cardiac treatment and surgery with the help of the Lila Foundation. All costs and expense will be met by the foundation, with the foundation team led by founder Dr. Keck Milon and co-founder Dr. Kimberly Milon. Suli Suli, National MTV News. 220 million Kina worth contracts were officially signed today by the National Airport Corporation and the contractors for six projects on seven airports within the country. Michelle Awamoromoro with this report. Over the next five years, the government will spend 220 million kina to upgrade seven airports. The airports include Tokua, Nadzab, and Meden. The airport improvements will complement the government's ongoing push to build tourism in various locations. It's going to be very difficult to cover this country with a road network. We're going to rely into the future, long into the future, some of these areas have to be serviced by air. That's the reality, as some of us have to be serviced by sea um, because of practical situations of you physically can't get roads there. Madden is the biggest project. It includes a runway upgrade and a new terminal costing more than 77 million kina. For WeWork, a runway extension and other works, more than 50 million kina. For Wapenamanda, aircraft pavement upgrading, a new terminal and other works costing more than 30 million kina. For Vanimo, a runway extension, more than 30 million kina. Tokua and Nadzeb stand by power supply upgrade costing more than 9 million kina. For Tari, a supply and installment of security fencing and other works costing more than 7 million kina. It is a pleasure to again witness and be part of the contract signing ceremony for the record six CADIP projects. These projects represent a significant investment for our people at the respective project sites and throughout the nation. This contract signing program was initially for seven airports. However, Tari's contract signing was deferred to a later date. I'm really impressed with the, the transformation we've seen in our airports. I must say there are one or two concerns about some of the, the quality of one or two of our contractors. And uh, I want to say this morning we are looking for high quality work that will, that will meet the test of time. I don't want taps falling off and rust starting to show in, in sinks, in toilets after one or two months. That's not the kind of work we are looking at. So to the contractors, 
I think your future in this program will depend very much on the quality of work you deliver, not only in a month or two months after completion, but of course beyond that. So we are looking at some high quality work so we can continue the good work that has been done over the first phase of this program. Michelle Awamoromoro, National MTV News. You at Wednesday's news. When we come back, we take a look at stories making headlines overseas. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, firefighters in the U.S. are still struggling to gain control of the deadliest and most destructive wildfires in California's history. At least 48 people have been killed in the worst blaze, but it's feared that number will rise with hundreds still missing. Night and all out assault on the Woolsey fire. The terrain is too steep. You can't get hand crews in here. DC 10s and Chinook helicopters attacking a new flare up after a week of intense firefighting. Argio Benita saw the battle firsthand. Firefighters taking no chances. At the campfire north of Sacramento, hundreds still missing, many more grateful to be alive. There's explosions everywhere. <laughs> Oh my God, people's tires are popping. Michelle and Daniel Simmons and their four kids barely escaped the flames. Ah, it's okay, you guys, it's okay. Just keep going, keep going, baby, keep going. There's a woman on the side of the road running with her baby. Do you know if she made it? We don't know. Simmons' entire family, more than 50 people, all losing their homes. It's that fine line between just being so incredibly grateful to be alive and just so, so sad because you know, that was our life. Everybody I know lost everything. It's real sad. Brad Weldon, one of the only residents still in paradise, his house north. amazingly still standing in a neighborhood Fire reduced to ash. I don't know if I was brave enough or stupid enough, but we stayed and fought it, and Mom wouldn't have left even if I wanted her to, so... And she's 90 years old and blind. Tens of thousands displaced. Glad you're good. At this makeshift tent city, a family of 19 reunited. A healing moment for a community scarred by disaster. The trial of one of the world's most powerful drug lords has been under heavy security in New York. El Chapo faces numerous charges including conspiring to murder and drug trafficking. Security at the Brooklyn court is tight given his history of daring prison escapes. Police today escorted jurists to and from court with two already asking to be excused. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman was the U.S. authorities' greatest prize in the war on drugs. He is known internationally as the leader of the world's most powerful and violent drug cartel. His extradition to the United States from Mexico almost two years ago set the stage for what is sure to be the biggest trial for narcotics crimes in U.S. history. Prosecutors accuse him of trafficking drugs such as cocaine and heroin worth $14 billion into the country through the Sinaloa cartel. But his defense attorney says his reputation doesn't match the reality. He is the perfect scapegoat. You'd think that he was the only drug dealer in Mexico, that he was the only leader. There are leaders of the Sinaloa cartel that are as big as him, bigger than him alleged to be. You don't even know their names. Before his capture following this dramatic raid, El Chapo Guzman was a mythical figure because of his ability to evade law enforcement in Mexico for decades. He twice escaped from maximum security prisons, once through a mile-long tunnel from his jail cell shower. Peter Vincent, a former Justice Department official, says it was El Chapo Guzman's own mistakes that led to his arrest. He ultimately was undone by his own arrogance and his own sense of uh, ability to get himself out of any jam. It's said he was planning to make a film about his life. After a secret meeting with actor Sean Penn, he agreed to record an interview. Este, que la droga 
The tape will likely feature in his trial, alongside evidence such as wiretaps, drug and weapon seizures, and testimony from rival cartel members. Britain's messy divorce from the European Union is tonight coming to an end two and a half years after the Brexit vote negotiators on both sides have agreed on a draft plan. But there's already strong opposition with a political mountain to climb before it's passed. About a deal, Mr. Javid. deal or no deal, the political game show with the nation's future at stake. It, it's the biggest crisis in modern peacetime British history. Details are under wraps, but what to do with Ireland has blocked a deal so far. Most Irish don't want a north-south customs border that would stem free-flowing trade and split communities. But there are deep fears that if the north were to keep trading freely with the south, it would essentially be absorbed by the EU after Brexit next March. So it's understood that under the draft deal, the entire UK would keep trading with the EU as it does now, until someone comes up with a better plan. Brexiteers say that's not what they fought for. For the first time in a thousand years, uh, this place, this parliament, uh, will not have a say over the laws that govern this country. It is a quite incredible state of affairs. It will mean that we are having to accept rules and regulations from Brussels over which we have no say ourselves. This is a significant step, but there's still a very long way to go yet. Overnight, Theresa May could get this draft through her cabinet, yes, but even if she does, she still has to get it rubber stamped by the rest of the European Union at a summit in a couple of weeks. And then the mega battle, trying to get this deal through the Houses of Parliament and its band of Brexiteers. And the clock's ticking. A no deal Brexit could cause chaos at the borders and rattle financial markets. Brexit is a tragedy for Europe and we mustn't add to that the drama of the UK departing in a disorganised way. And the drama continues tonight with Britain's cabinet and European officials holding emergency meetings. To Washington now, where a stark shakeup looms at the White House. According to sources, U.S. President Donald Trump is now eyeing possible replacements for a number of posts, including his chief of staff. And already one senior aide is headed for the exit after a feud with the First Lady's office. The United States has deep ties. Late today, Mira Ricardell was seen with the president at his only public event at the White House. Tonight, she was ousted from the West Wing, fired from her role as deputy national security advisor after drawing the ire not of the president, but of the first lady. In a rare rebuke tonight, the first lady demanded Ricardell, John Bolton's deputy, be fired, saying in a statement she no longer deserves the honor of serving in this White House. Rick Cardell recently feuded with the First Lady over her trip to Africa, arguing over seating on the plane and National Security Council resources, one source tells CNN. The sources say the president is also considering potential replacements for other senior positions, both inside the cabinet and the White House. We're looking at a lot of different things, including cabinet. The potential shakeup could include Chief of Staff John Kelly and Secretary of Homeland Security Kristen Nelson, officials tell CNN. At the White House today, the president ignored questions about staffing changes. Thank you very much. The president is said to be unhappy with Secretary Nielsen's handling of immigration and border security and could ask for her resignation in the coming days. Multiple officials familiar with the matter tell CNN. The president's angst today was not just reserved for his own team. Trump trolling one-time close ally French President Emmanuel Macron, launching a barrage of incendiary tweets saying that the French, quote, were starting to learn German in Paris before the U.S. came along, pay for NATO or not, and threatening to impose new tariffs on French wine. Quote, France makes it very hard for the U.S. to sell its wine into France and charges big tariffs, whereas the U.S. makes it easy for French wines and charges very small tariffs. Not fair. Must change. Mr. Trump's frustration with friends and allies comes as he continues to be dogged by the special counsel's Russia probe. CNN has learned the president met with his legal team over the Veterans Day holiday to go over a series of written questions for Mueller's team. The questions focus on colluding with Russia, but not 
obstruction of justice, part of an agreement reached with Mueller's team to, quote, move forward with the president's participation, according to a source. A source familiar with the process says the president is once again meeting with his legal team at the White House today, and the anticipation is to give Mueller's team the answers to those questions within the coming days. Now, as for Rick Cardell, CNN has reached out to her for comment and has not heard back. Up next, some sporting updates in Chukai Sports. Don't go away. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. Coca-Cola has renewed its partnership with the Ipatas Cup. Today it signed on as naming rights sponsor for the Coca-Cola Ipatas Cup 2019. Today's signing also saw the tournament organizers present their reports on their performance this year. Global soft drink company Coca-Cola today renewed its partnership with the Ipatas Cup for the next three years. The Coca-Cola Ipatas Cup is a professionally managed competition and has 18 coordinators throughout PNG coordinating their own zones. We give credit to Coca-Cola for their continued support. We've seen 132 uh, youths from rural part of Papua New Guinea making into the national team and 75% uh, of uh, this, uh, the Coca-Cola Ipatoska players have now made it to Antas, a 60-man squad they will announce very soon. The 75% is from the Coca-Cola Ipatoska. Coca-Cola is there everywhere in PNG. Coca-Cola marketing and sales service manager Jamal Benshik said the company had supported the Ipatas Cup for more than two decades and the relationship between Coca-Cola and the Ipatas Cup was now a fully-fledged partnership. We are looking forward to for the kickoff of this competition so that all together can enjoy rugby and we can enjoy Coca-Cola on the field. Whilst the renewed partnership is financial, Coca-Cola will also provide merchandising to support the competition's aim to cultivate talent in rural areas to take part in the nation's most beloved sports rugby league. Isaiah Tare, National MTV News. The National Soccer League competition is set to kick off on the 19th of January 2019. PNGFA and the NSL board have come up with a new approach to the competition structure for the new season. Their aim is to include teams from all over the country to participate in the NSL competition. They have encouraged the 18 associations to include a franchise club into the 2019 season. PNJFA President John Capinato says they want to give an opportunity to players across the nation to showcase their skills. We want to look into the whole of the country. In the last maybe 11, 12 years, we've always looked between Port Moresby and Leigh and Port Moresby and Leigh. And the cost has been also very high. Uh, some of the clubs could not afford, and, and we look into that. So after the March discussion on uh, Monday, we realized that the football must go through the four regions of the country. The new competition structure will see matches played in the four regions of the country simultaneously. Now the plan is to have seven teams from Southern and Northern Conference, uh, Omomase, and six teams from New Guinea Islands and the Islands region. And we intend to complete the first round, then we will go into the second round. And the second round will include the top two of the four regions. Then they will play again Omenawe until uh, we, we arrive at, we will be the finals uh, or the champions for the following, uh, for the year. And the, the champions and the runner-up uh, we represent us in the OFC Club Championship in, in 2020. The expression of interest for teams to participate in the competition is out and closes on the 14th of December. The cost of team registration has been slashed from 80,000 kina to 50,000 kina. The total fee for, for team registration is 50,000 kina. The place registration remains the same at, at, uh, at 50, 50 kina per player. 
Again, we are looking at registering the same amount of players as we, as we said last year, about 25 players each team, but with the maximum of about 30. Including different centres and associations into the NSL is the first step PNGFA has done to get many people involved in the game. PNGFA has plans to make the NSL a professional tournament in the coming years. If we want to take everybody to the next level, the level of our competition will be up and down. Not everybody will be at the same level. So, but I think firstly, let's look at what we want to do now is being inclusive. We include all the regions. And that will depend on the expression of interest. Elijah Lavette, National NTV Sports. The Scrum Oval in Leh will be occupied over the weekend by the students from the primary and secondary schools from three districts in Morbe, including Leh, for the Junior Rugby Schools program. The long-serving junior coach and Morbe Rugby Development Manager Robin Tarere said the purpose of the carnival is to promote the game of rugby in rural schools. The Morbe Junior Rugby School program will be played on Friday and Saturday. Schoolgirls will also be participating in the carnival. The, the information uh, we're giving out to all the uh, schools and teachers are, are very informative and, and they're very interested in, in, uh, in taking part in the program. Bulolo was, uh, we conducted the carnival in Bulolo last year, uh, just before the election. And uh, we had about 300 plus kids taking part in the program and 12 schools took part in the program primary schools in the Wau Bulolo district. So uh, we, we're slowly going through those districts and the interest is there. And, uh, and I think the, they want, uh, the, our problem is uh, uh, manpower resources and, and uh, get PNG Rugby to come and start educating the teachers, running uh, accreditation courses for, for the teachers. We've been running. Guys, sports continues with more after this break. Stay tuned. True Kai Sports. Welcome back. The All Blacks often talk up their opposition, but this week it's no bloody against the number two ranked rugby side in the world, Ireland. A narrow repeat of last weekend's slow start and sloppiness will make their task even harder in Dublin. The All Blacks doing their best to warm up in Dublin's biting temperatures, even getting a bit heated among friends as they prepare to reignite their newfound rivalry with the Irish. This is arguably the All Blacks' biggest game of the year, the two top-ranked teams in the world facing off against each other. Yeah, whoever wins this is the best team in the world right now, so uh, that's a massive challenge um, for this team, but it's one that the group's pretty excited about. Bowden Barrett debuted for the All Blacks against Ireland six years ago in the 60-0 thumping in Hamilton. But he was also part of the team that lost to Ireland in Chicago two years ago. When you do lose an All Black jersey, it's it's never nice, and uh, yeah, we can draw from those experiences. Um, just a, a small reminder of how we felt in that change room to always respect Ireland. And he says they most definitely will on Sunday. What we've seen recently isn't the same Irish defence as what we've seen in the past. They're always changing, always growing and evolving. And so he says is his game thanks to playing in the Northern Hemisphere. We have to adapt on the go. We can assume some things going into a game, but then they change. Uh, weather conditions have an influence up here especially, so um, yeah, it's a great test. Assistant coach Ian Foster hoping for a better start to the game after what he called a messy start against England. Oh, it's been the key is looking at the small parts and trying to figure out, you know, were we a little bit mentally too alert, were we trying too hard, were we chasing too much. Whatever it was, he's hoping it won't be repeated. And that ends Trukai Sports. The weather details up next. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Quick look at the weather in the Highlands region. 
Showers and thunderstorms in Mount Hagen, Groka, Kundiawa and cloudy in Mendi and Wabeg with morning fog. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's been Wednesday's news. On behalf of the news team and myself, pleasant viewing and have a good night.